Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Inasmuch many, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Amen. Let me, let me tell you uh, about my, my particular challenge today. It's actually a challenge that every, every teacher of the Bible has, every preacher. Uh, one of the things that I stress continually over and over, and, and I bring them to, to light as much, as, uh, as often as I can to make you aware of these things, but one of the basic things that we practice when we read the Bible is that before we ever start inserting ourselves into the Bible, before we ever start immediately moving to application, uh, first, we want to identify a few things about a particular book, and uh, we, already get, we already got past the first thing is uh, who's the author and what is his purpose. Those two things are very easy because it says that he's writing to compile a narrative of, of the things that God accomplished uh, among us, even though he says the things that were accomplished, meaning you know, he's saying it passively, but what's really implied is uh, these are the, uh, the things that God accomplished among us in fulfillment of the things that he promised. And so he's not only giving us a narrative of those things, but if you look at verse 4, he's also speaking to a particular individual, and he's telling that individual that he's writing these things so that he may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. What that means is that uh, he wants them to have assurance about the truthfulness about what this particular recipient has already been taught. And, and here's what I want to point out, that we know who the author is, we know what the purpose is, and so when you read the Bible, and even when you teach the Bible, when you preach the Bible, one of the very first things you've got to consider is, who is the author writing to initially? Because, because we say things like, well, the Bible is written for us, God wrote the Bible and he wrote it for us. Well, yes, that's true, but we have to understand that the, the Bible was written by men uh, whom God inspired to write, the text is inspired, and it was uh, delivered to someone before it was delivered to us. And so when we talk like this, we're asking, who was the initial recipient? When the Bible was written, who did it first fall into? Uh, whose hands? And in this case, the letter, the gospel according to Luke and, and the book of Acts, it first came into the hands of Theophilus. And, and you know what that tells us? It tells us that, well, what we should gather from this is that how you communicate to somebody largely depends on your knowledge about where that person is at. You don't talk to your husband or wife or children all in the same way. I don't talk to my daughter, Sophia. She's six years old. I, I don't speak to her uh, assuming that she knows certain things. The other day, in fact, just, just yesterday, Letty comes home and she brought uh, a sign from uh, Hobby Lobby and, and she put it on Chris's door. Look, Chris, what I got you. And it says, um, it says, ready, get set, go away. Right? So she bought it for Chris's door, you know, so he can have his, you know, masculine privacy and the girl's room is their room and then the boy's room is, and, and so, um, so that reminded me of, Letty didn't grow up in the United States. Um, the coyote brought her away. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but <laughs> no, <laughs> no uh, she's legal, okay? That was the arrangement when, when we got married. Look, I'll give you papers if you marry me. And no, I'm just kidding. We have to edit that out bad because that's not good. No, no, she was, she was, uh, she's legal. But Letty grew up in Mexico. And so English wasn't her, English wasn't her, uh, her first language. And so she would say things, and I'm glad she's not here. Uh, she would say things that were not correct. And I told the kids yesterday at the table, I said, hey, guess what your mom used to say when she was a little girl growing up like you guys? You know, you, you play races, and you say, ready, get set, go, and you'd race. Well, your mom, because she wasn't that well of an English speaker, she would say, ready, cassette, go. <laughs> and then Chris started laughing, and Sophia said, dad, what's a cassette? 
And then that's when my age was revealed, like, wow. <laughs> and, then, and then Chris says, uh, Sophia, a cassette is like those VHS tapes that you put in the VCR. And I'm thinking, no, it's those tapes that you put in your car and you listen to music. And maybe he doesn't know about those, but he knows about the VHS cassette. But you see, Sophia doesn't have any knowledge of, of, uh, of what a, a VHS cassette, what an A-track is. Uh, what a record is, you know. Well, I remember one time saying among youth, I said, man, I know I sound like a broken record and I got these confused looks. Like, what? Or, and I said, a broken, you know, never mind. I hate to repeat myself is what I'm, I know I'm sounding repetitious. So I had to change because the moment that I said, the moment that I said, I know I sound like a broken record and I said it among a lot of young people and they looked at me like, what is that? And then I had to rephrase it. I said, I know I sound repetitive and they're like, oh, because they don't have that, Maybe some of them do, maybe some of them don't. And my point is this, that when you talk to somebody, you consider where they're at as far as their understanding. You have to consider that. And then you have to, um, you have to, you have to tailor or you have to communicate in a way that they will understand. So you, you have a general idea of what they know and what they don't know. And, and this, is per, this is particularly challenging when I preach because I know some of you know some things because you've been a believer longer and, and some of you are more new to the faith. And so, um, and I'm always reminded of the scripture in Hebrews which says that, um, that he had many more things to say, but being that they were still very immature in their learning, he couldn't say them. And I'm like, ah, so we lose out just because these people hadn't grown up. You know, so the writer of Hebrews, he doesn't write further because they're not at a level where, where they can understand. And so, but you know, everyone, well, I don't want to say that's what God chose to write, but it does make me curious about what he would have expanded on further. But why am I telling you this? Because we need to first consider the fact that, that Luke is writing to Theophilus. And before you ever approach the book as in what's he saying to me, is we have to first consider what's he saying to Theophilus. What does Theophilus know? And you'll find that Luke makes certain assumptions about what Theophilus knows. And, and Luke makes these assumptions about what Theophilus knows that I cannot make about us. Do you understand? So then what I have to do is, is I have to try to get a gauge of where we're at. Uh, and not assume you know or don't know or, you know, it's challenging. And so... One of the things, and here's where I'm going with this, one of the things that is, is, that is dominant, or the thing that is dominant, is the teaching of the kingdom of God. So I asked myself, do we know as a church, does everyone in our church know uh, what the kingdom of God means? And, and what exactly is being worked out? Because Luke is assuming that Theophilus knows these things. I can't make the same assumptions about my audience. Um, Luke is making assumptions about um, so, do you understand, do you, do you understand that the bridge that I have to build between Theophilus as the initial recipient, as Luke's first recipient, I, I cannot just make assumptions. And, and you'd think, okay, and by, look, listen, I by no means whatsoever uh, am trying to insult anyone, because sometimes I talk like this and people get upset and they, man, Chris, you treat us like we're stupid. No, no, that's not... I, I, don't want, I don't want anyone to miss out. So if you know these things, I'm like, well, praise God, I know those things. And if you don't, then we learn together. So I'm not assuming the worst. I'm just, I'm trying to hit the, the, the broadest uh, group of people. Okay, so we'll move on. Let me, let me tell you uh, about the kingdom of God. And that's what we're going to concentrate on. The reason I'm doing this is because if we're going to understand the book of Acts in the weeks to come, we need to get some foundational, um, we need to get some foundational things settled. Okay, so... Um, the kingdom of God, what, what exactly is that? Well, if you look at the world, if you look at all of the problems of the world, uh, you'll find that everyone has the same problem pretty much at some level or another. Um, the first and, and the greatest problem is death, right? Everyone dies. It doesn't matter whether you live in America, whether you live in another continent. Um, we're all human beings and everyone dies, Everyone dies. The second problem is um, government, right? No, this is not a political message, but 
uh, government is flawed and you can come up with the best kind of government that you would come up with and people think that democracy is the greatest form of government and many people miss the fact that the democracy is simply a reflection of the people. And so whatever laws our, our, our democracy passes, it's just simply a reflection of where we're at spiritually. So if the entire United States is immoral, if the members of Congress are immoral, they'll pass immoral legislation. They, they, you know, because, because the standard is in the people. Well, maybe it's better to have maybe a monarch, a king with absolute power. Well, that would turn out to be a good thing if the king was good. But if the king is bad, then... It doesn't really matter what kind of earthly government you form, okay? You're always going to have corrupt uh, individuals in the offices of government. And because these individuals are corrupt, you have imperfect government. You may have an abusive government. You may have a, a, a government that is wasteful with, with uh, the resources that is entrusted to it from the people. Um, and, then we, and then, folks, we also have enemies. Uh, we have enemies abroad. And so what exactly is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is pretty much God's, and I'm being very, very general here. The kingdom of God is, is essentially God's plan that he will ultimately fulfill, but it's already being fulfilled to number one, eradicate death, okay? So imagine being part of a country, a part of a kingdom in which no one dies. There's no morgues, there are no cemeteries, uh, there are no doctors, there are no clinics, no hospitals, there, there isn't any of that. So the first thing that God takes care of is he eradicates death. The second thing that God does is he sets up a, a new government, okay? And it's a monarchy, okay? It's not a democracy, okay? And guess who that monarch is? Jesus. So now you have someone who is without sin, who's perfectly righteous, thrice holy. Would you trust a government like that? Yes, you would. Are you going to be sh shouting, democracy, let's, let's vote Jesus for another term, right? You have a perfect government. Why? Because Jesus is the image of, the in is the image of God. Jesus is God in human flesh. And when you set up, not that we set up, but when Christ is set up by God the Father as the monarch, that, and he is, okay, then you have a perfect government. That's the kingdom of God. The third thing is dealing with enemies. You know, even uh, Israel, God, God promised that he would bring Israel out of slavery, and he did. And he drove out the enemies from the land, and he set up Israel. And uh, the king that enjoyed the most peace, and they never experienced it after that, was King Solomon. Uh, the, you know, he, it, was, it was a very prosperous time, um, and uh, there were hardly any wars, 40 years. Um, in fact, um, speaking of that, that just came to mind right now. There was a, a few years ago, I did a study on, uh, I looked into, has there ever been a time in which the entire world, and I hope I don't say this wrong, because again, I'm, I remember this, I might, I might say it wrong, but has there ever been a time in recorded history, we're in, you could look at the world at a particular moment in time and there wasn't a war happening on some, some skirmish, some battle countries. And, and, and I can't remember what year it was, but there was a particular year when no one was at war for 17 minutes. For 17 minutes, the world experienced peace. Humanity has always been at war with each other over all kinds of things, Right? The kingdom of God promises to eradicate that by ultimately separating the sheep from the goats and doing away with the, the troublemakers, the, the people who make war because of sin and, and, and all of that. That's what the kingdom of, of God is. Now, we understand that God is sovereign and he's in charge over everything, right? So you cannot say, well, God is my God, but my neighbor who doesn't believe in God, he's not his God. No, God is God of everyone. Um, even the devil, God is God over him. The difference between us and unbelievers is the fact that we're at peace with God because we've received the gift of salvation and we have been reconciled to him. But nevertheless, this is God's world. This is God's planet. And, and unbelievers live under the illusion. They live under the illusion 
that they can go about in this world and whenever they want to get right with God, they can. And they think of, they think of their lives in, in, in like this. My life, my money, my house, my car, my property, my career, my, 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 mine, mine, mine. That's how unbelievers think. And God says, my house, my car, my property, my water, my mountains, my earth, everything. The earth is the Lord's in all its fullness and you're living on borrowed time. Everything you have, I'm allowing you, whether you believe I exist or not, I'm allowing you to have it in your care. But one day, you're going to die and you're going to stand before me and we're going to talk about how you handled your resources, what you did with your life, what you did with my son. And so unbelievers live under this illusion that they have no accountability to God. But I've often said, we don't make Jesus Lord. You don't make Jesus Lord. You understand that? You don't make, we made Obama president, but we don't make Jesus Lord. Well, what do you mean? God the Father has set up Jesus Christ as Lord. The difference is whether you acknowledge that he's Lord or not. Look, people today can say, well, Obama, he's not my president. Well, no, he is. Well, I dislike him. It doesn't matter. He's your president, right? Because you are a United States citizen, and that is the man in office. And whether you like it, you can kick and scream all you want. I do, right? But he's your president. And if there were a draft, and I were to go, I'm too old for a draft now, right? 35 is the age limit, right? And I'm like, never mind, irrelevant. I would have to go, <laughs> I would have to go fight. As, or anyway, if you got drafted, and Obama would be your commander-in-chief whether you liked it or not. Now, you could become rebellious, you can dodge the draft, you can run and you can hide, but ultimately, the U.S. government will find you and you'll have to be accountable for running from your responsibilities. In the same way, you may um, ignore God, uh, you may try to run away from Him, you may like to pretend like you're doing your own thing, it's your life, but really, you're accountable to him whether you acknowledge he exists or not, whether you believe or not. That's the state of the world. Unbelievers, we don't make Jesus Lord. It's a matter of whether you acknowledge him as Lord and whether you submit to him or whether you continue to defy him. But either way, right now, as we speak, Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God the Father, ruling all of creation. And the universe belongs to him, and Jesus has in his kingdom the majority of people are still rebels. And so you have this remnant of believers living in the world and you have a majority of rebels. So what exactly is the kingdom of God? Well, if you turn to Acts uh, chapter eight, uh, chapter 1, let's go to Acts. Now I'm giving a, I'm giving a real brief overview of all of this and, and we'll get into more detail uh, here as, as, uh, in, the, in the weeks to come. But um, I wanted you to have a... Uh, I wanted you to have a... Uh, Uh, an understanding of the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 1. Um, put yourself in the shoes of a, of a Jew at the time. The, uh, by far their greatest king was uh, David. Uh, you know, well, there was Solomon, but David. But God promised that now David's throne, his dynasty came to an end. And God had promised that he would restore the dynasty of David. And that this, the dynasty of David would never come to an end. And so when the Jews heard about the coming of the kingdom of God, the restoration of the kingdom of God, now, um, they understood it in those terms. They understood it in terms of finally we'll be at peace again. The Romans will be kicked out. But folks, again, let me just... Um, how many of you either own a house or are looking to own a house or own your own property, right? It's a, it's a good thing, right? Uh, and then you enjoy it for, you know, a few decades and then you die. Well, that's very encouraging, <laughs> right? I mean, you ever seen people fight and, and they live and they become enslaved to their house or their land or to the material possessions? I mean, how long can you enjoy that, really? How long can you enjoy that? You, you get a brand new car, then it's outdated, and then you get to the point where you can't even drive anymore, whether either it's your health, your vision, whatever. So, folks, what good are the promises of God if he promises you to give you a, a time of peace, a better government? If you're only going to, I mean, what if you received that promise when you're 60 years old, 70 years old, 80 years old? 
Like God promised Abraham that he'd give him a land and he gave him all these promises. Well, Abraham could say, well, that's nice, but I'll be dead in a few years and I mean, I guess my children will enjoy it, right? And that's how we think. We think in terms of, you know, I've, I've thought about, man, I really need to start doing better about saving up money because, you know, if I die or when I die, I don't know when that'll happen. But even if my kids are adults and I die then, I want, I want to leave them some sort of, you know, inheritance, you know, like my lawnmower and, you know, Chris can start his own. Right, <laughs> pobrecito. Right. Ah, you understood that word, right? Pobrecito. But you know what would be better? Is if uh, I leave him an inheritance, I die, and then I come back to life, and then I enjoy it with him. That would be better, right? Folks, that's the kingdom of God. That's exactly what the kingdom of God. The Jews looked forward to a perfect government. The other thing I didn't mention is God promised to deal with the sin problem. How so? He promised a time in which he would pour out his Holy Spirit because why do people sin? We sin because we're, we're, we're sinners. We don't... We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. And so God promised a time in which he would give us of his Holy Spirit to empower us to no longer live enslaved to sin. And so the book of Luke is this. God sent forth a Savior. He's the one who will restore David's throne. He'll sit upon it and he'll rule forever. Perfect government. Secondly, this David, this new David, which is Jesus Christ, he will pour out from God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will inhabit people, give them new life and new birth, and people will no longer be slaves to sin. This new David will atone for everyone, all of the citizens of the kingdom. He will atone for their sins and they'll live forever. And those who have died up until that time, they'll be resurrected and will all be one big happy family again. No death, no sickness, no more tears, no more poverty. Everything that currently uh, is messed up with the world will not be so with the kingdom of heaven. And so now the question is, Chris, when does this kingdom come? Well, it's already, but... Not yet. And that's a distinction that, that people in the church have made theologians. That the kingdom of God is already, but not yet. Well, what do you mean by already? Well, if you think about it, can you be made right with God now? What if I ask you, are, are you already made right with God? Many of you would say, yes, I'm already. But are you with the Lord now? Well, not yet. You see? So, here's what happened. Here, here's what has happened. Uh, do you remember when Jesus comes on the scene... And he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand or is among you. What does it mean? Well, the very fact that he's here, that the king is here, that is, he's the king. And because the king is in our midst, the presence of the kingdom is among us as evidenced by miracles and all of that. And so if this is, an, this is something that we need to understand as believers that God, you can be made right with God now. You don't have to return, you don't have to wait until, uh, for the return of Christ. You can be made right with God now and you can be made a citizen of the kingdom of God now. God can adopt you now and when Christ returns, he's coming for those who belong to him. Okay, he's coming for his people. So the time to get right with God is now. You can already be made right with God, but the resurrection is not yet. Now, let's go to John chapter 3. I want to show you something uh, very quickly. And I want to make a distinction between the first coming and, and the second coming. And in the weeks to come, we're going to get into more detail about these things. And the reason, again, I'm doing this is because um, as we go into the book of Acts, I, we need to understand in terms of Luke is describing in the book of Acts, he's describing the kingdom of God. What does the kingdom of God look like now? Who, who's in the kingdom? How, does, how do we decide who's in the kingdom and who's not? And so those are the questions that Luke answers. But look at John chapter 3. A lot of people say things like this. And I, and I, don't, I don't think they really understand what they mean by that. Uh, I, I, well, I don't think they understand what they're saying. They say things like John chapter 3 verse 17 People say things like this. You know, you shouldn't judge others and you shouldn't condemn them. 
Because you know what Jesus says, he didn't come to condemn the world. Well, and, and that's true, but what they do, they, they, they make a mistake into thinking that Jesus will never condemn the world, that Jesus will never judge the world, Jesus will never deal with the world. That's, that's what they mean. But when Jesus said in verse 17, he said, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. How many times does Jesus come to the earth? This is his first coming. And we're awaiting his second coming. Do you believe that his mission in the first coming is different than his mission in the second coming? What did he come to do in the first coming? We just read it. To save people. When Christ came, his attitude is right now, it's not a time for judgment. You know why it's not a time for judgment? Because according to the Bible, the world has already been judged in Adam with the first human beings. The Bible says that all of humanity, everyone, is already condemned by God because we're in Adam, we're sinners, and we sin. And so if, you, you've, if you've not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says you don't have to wait for a day of condemnation, the Bible says you presently stand condemned. Well, well, how so? Well, it's like when, when someone is convicted of a crime, but then the phase of sentencing is at a future date. Think of it that way. We've already been condemned. We've already been convicted by God. And, and the second coming of Christ is merely a day of formal sentencing. It's not a day to decide whether you're guilty or not guilty. It's not a day where you're going to be given an opportunity to plead your case on why you know, God should forgive you. It has nothing to do with that. It's a sentencing phase. Do we understand that? And so in the first coming, Jesus says, I did not come, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. This is why Jesus uh, rebuked his disciples. They were out preaching and uh, there were some people, the Samaritans I believe, um, they had rejected Jesus when they found out that Jesus was going to Jerusalem and they rejected him and the disciples got so angry and they asked Jesus, do you want us to call down fire from heaven? Pretty much to kill these people. And Jesus rebuked them. And he says, I did not, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, I didn't come to take men's lives, but to save them. Time for judgment is it now. And that's why the church um, has no power. And again, this is, a, this is an issue of bad Bible interpretation. People throw it in your face. Well, if you really believe the Bible, David, you know, you believe that if you're one day you'll have a son and if he gets out of hand, you should take him outside and stone him. And, you know, because that's what the Bible says. If you have an unruly children or unruly, you know, you take him outside and you stone them. And what about your wife? If she cheats on you, should you kill her? And they throw all these Old Testament laws and they don't make the distinction between that was a theocratic kingdom, but the church doesn't live under that. We, we don't have any civil powers. Okay? Uh, God hasn't granted us any of that. So you may ask, well, Chris, well then, the church cannot really enforce any kind of discipline? Look, not to minimize it, but it is really serious. Okay? Um, if you are a believer, if you're someone who professes the name of Christ, you call yourself a believer, and you live in, in what I mean, and I'm not saying if you sin, because we all sin. I'm talking about if you live um, a habitually sinful lifestyle, you engage in sin week in and week out as a matter of lifestyle, not as a matter of weakness, as a matter of I'm struggling with sin, I'm trying to do, no, but as a matter of full-blown, unrepentant, I don't care, it's my life, I'll do what I want, that kind of lifestyle, okay, um, then what's your relationship to the church? Well, if you are an unbeliever and you, you come to church here weekly and you live like that, then um, really the church, all we can do is minister to you, exhort you, entreat you, preach in hopes that God will save you. But you see, once you're saved and once you make that profession, once you identify with the people of God and, and you live like that, the church, fellow brothers and sisters, not only me, but every one of you, you have a responsibility to plead with fellow brothers and sisters 
to stop sinning. Okay? It, listen. Um, if you are a believer and you hang out with other believers and those other believers are immoral and they live that way, you should stop hanging out with them. Okay? The Bible does not prohibit you from hanging out with unbelievers who sin. Okay? The Bible is concerned with you hanging out with other believers who, sin, who live that way. Okay? So here's what happens. If you are a believer and you're hanging out with somebody who professes to be a Christian and they show no fruit whatsoever um, and you hang out with them, it's, it's a way for you to endorse that lifestyle. And your silence is a form of cowardice and the fact that you don't say anything is, is encouraging them in that. You're not loving them. You're being hateful towards them. Okay? And I'm not talking about, you stop it right now. And, you know, I'm talking about pleading gracefully uh, in the way that God pleads with sinners. Like, God welcomes the prodigal son. And so, uh, you really, really need to be careful about hanging out with people who say they're believers and they prove immoral. Okay? You have no, we have like, you need to separate from them. And I know it sounds extreme, but this is taken directly from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Well, Chris, well then, what, what if... What's the worst the church can do? Um, you'll very, you'll, you'll, we've never had to practice it here because usually when I've addressed an issue, people leave on their own. Um, that's sad, you know? I mean, it's sad, but that's, that's really what ends up happening when you try to talk with somebody and I, and I try to plead with them. Uh, it, it, you know, I'm out of here. Well, I tried. But the, the, I don't want to make, again, I don't want to minimize it. What's the worst the church can do? Uh, the church is instructed to, to plead with people who profess to know Christ, but they're living that way. Um, and, and there's a process. And if ultimately they don't want to, then they're to be disfellowshipped from the church. Uh, they're to be removed from the church. They're to be considered as not even, like not even saved. Because one of the evidences of being saved is the fact that you obey Jesus. Uh, and, and so when a person really belongs to the Lord, the Lord in love will send people. And again, we've never had to practice that here. I mean, we've been here five years. We've never had to practice that. Uh, and so I dread the day that I have to. I hope I never do. Um, and we're still in the process of maybe developing elders to help in that. Um, but it, it really is out of love. Um, it, you know, people may think it's harsh, but... It's, it's, if you're a parent, you understand this. Miha, I don't want you around her. Son, I don't want you around him. Right? We understand that as parents. Why, why do we say that? You know, it's a, that's, a, no, that's a whole other story. It, it's, it's amazing sometimes to me how parents... Um, never mind. <laughs> we don't want our children hanging around with certain people because of the bad influence. Okay? My, my, look, I worked at the school. Okay? I worked at the school for years. Kids become sexually active as early as middle school. Okay? I know that's horrible to hear, but like, own, face up to it, parents. We're sending our kids to school. I've been there. I've walked the hallways. I've been in the classroom. I know what it's like. And my kids come home from school, and they pretend like everything. I said, no, look, look, look. I went to school in Rothstown. We're any public school. And I've, I've worked there. So don't sit there and tell me that your classmates are all pure and holy and they don't say bad words. And I said, Chris, Ariela, I know that your peers, many of them are sexually active. So don't treat me like I'm dumb, okay? You forget that I, up until last year, I was working there. I, was, I, was, I had a class of, that's where, you know, um, when I was working at the junior high, seventh graders, I had two girls in my class that were pregnant. You know, seventh grade, right? Seventh grade. Why am I saying all this again? I forgot. <laughs> so, so, oh yes, here's why I'm saying this. So my son comes up to me. Dad, can I go to the Valentine's dance at the school? Yeah, right? Right? I've been to those dances. And I, I've, I've been there and the teachers, that, yeah, they watch the kids. But I mean, really, how many adults can watch that many kids and keep your, eye, your eyes on all of them at the same time? These are not innocent little kids. You know, these are kids who are sexually active. Um, I went to, to a, a, a 15th birthday dance. And, and uh, you know, it was somebody that I knew. So I said, I'll go for a little while. So I went. I think it was at the High Chaparral, I think. I don't know. It was a few years ago. 
And we got 13, 14 year old kids dirty dancing, rubbing up against each other, like it's some nightclub. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm looking around and the parents aren't doing anything. You know, they're like, come on, Mika, yeah. All right, really? And you want to go to the Valentine's dance? Like my mom would say, no creo yo. All right, that's my mom's way of saying, I don't think so. And my son says, dad, why not? And I, I give him that stupid look. <laughs> really? Really? You, you're asking me that? Or my daughter, can I go spend the night at? No. <laughs> but dad, no. Hold on, let me think about it. Mm, no. That really annoys them. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I changed my mind. Let me think. Let me pray about it. Lord, he said no. <laughs> oh, I hate you. Why can't you just say no? You have to torture me like that. Because I want to communicate how strongly it's no, no. Now, yeah, I do let my daughter go out with certain friends. Um, you know, she has a few friends that I, I, the parents are very responsible. They've proven responsible. And, and they, there's not any brothers or, or other males. So I let them hang out with only girls and but other than that, folks, I'm not naive. I'm not dumb. I live in this world. Thankfully, God, praise God, I'm no longer of it, but I'm, I'm aware of the world. I'm aware of... So, as a parent, we understand that. Okay, right? We understand that as parents. So, let's not start to judge God. I can't believe God and the Apostle Paul are so mean. They don't want me hanging out with them. I mean, they're a brother or two in Christ. And, I mean, just because they're sleeping with, you know different people every week doesn't mean that they're not my sister in the Lord. Yeah, but like, think about what you're doing, really. Think about that. And of course, that's not the only sin. I mean, there's many other, you know, other sins, but should you have believer, uh, friends who are, of course you should have friends that are unbelievers. But come on, don't you, do you really need to be with them 24-7? 24-7? When I was a youth minister, um, I had a group of kids and they had a habit of hanging out with unbelievers and that was fine. I said, man, you need to be a witness to them and be a good example. But then it was like 24-7. And I told them, mark my words. Just give it some time. You're going to be like them. Was I right? Like always. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, that's horrible, right? No, look, it doesn't, look. It doesn't take any special intelligence, Okay. Most of us know it isn't, it's just life experience. If you hang around with somebody long enough, you eventually become like them. If you hang out with them long enough, you eventually become. Their sins that they think are so small, you begin to minimize them. Well, it's not that bad. And your, your conscience begins to get seared. And the things that used to be an outrage to you or that used to be a big deal to you, they're no longer a big deal to you because you've been desensitized by being around them week in and week out and you're no longer sensitive to the things, to the things of God. And there, there's the danger. So yes, have friends that are unbelievers, reach out to them, be positive, but know where to draw the line. People who profess to believe and know God and they're like that, don't hang out with them, period. Okay? Again, where'd you get that from? First Corinthians chapter 15. Folks, I, I'm really sorry, but I'm, I'm pretty much uh, running out of time. I'm out of time. So let me say this. If you, somebody can call Letty over here. Uh, I know that it wasn't a lot of scripture today, but I, I just really felt that this was necessary. Um, if anything, remember this about the kingdom of God. Okay. When we're talking about the kingdom of God, here's what we're talking about. We're not talking about uh, taking over Robstown and voting, you know, Jesus as the mayor, you know, and then, and then try to make all the cops Christians and everybody, because if we can just get everybody to be Christian in the kingdom of God. No, the kingdom of God, it, it's final consummation, it's final arrival, it's going to be at the second coming of Christ. So Christians are not supposed to try to set up a, a Christian government so to speak. But yes, we should try to influence government. We should vote. Uh, if, if some of us are gifted to run for political office, then you should run for political office. We ought to partake and, and, and uh, be involved in government, but let's not ever give ourselves the false idea that we can just get enough Christians in office, then things will really start turning around. That, that would be a really bad way to look at things. So the kingdom of God is already, but it's not yet because Christ has not returned. The kingdom of God is already because you're saved. 
but it's not yet because you've yet to be resurrected. And so we're talking about the kingdom of God. It's been inaugurated uh, through the book of Acts. And what the book of Acts is answering is telling us here who enters the kingdom of God. It's not based on race. It's not based on gender. Gender, I'm sorry. It's not based on whether you're male or female, whether you're young or old, or any of those things. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, King Jesus, who sits at right hand the who sits at the right hand of God the Father, will send his Holy Spirit. He'll pour him into your life. The Holy Spirit will empower you to no longer live as a worldly person, but as a person who belongs to the kingdom of God as you wait from him, as you wait for him from heaven uh, to the resurrection. And so that, that, that's, that's a kind of a rough overview uh, about the kingdom of God. And so I want to tell you that um, Obama is your president, okay? But Jesus is your king. Obama is temporary, pertains to earthly matters, but King Jesus is, and I'd hate to even compare them. They're not even worth comparing, but I'm giving you an idea that you have, you belong in this country, you live in this country, but ultimately your loyalty must transcend any other earthly loyalties. 